Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi and today we're having a look at some fascinating military projectiles. These are examples of what are known as flechettes. The name comes from the French meaning small arrows or darts and these have been used in a variety of weapon systems over the past hundred years. Though you could argue that they've actually been in use for a lot longer and indeed that they were the original firearms projectiles. Now, one of the earliest depictions of a firearm in use that we know about comes from the illuminated manuscript De Officius Regnum, written in 1326 by English scholar Walter de Millimete, and it depicts a soldier firing a strange vase-shaped cannon known as a pot de fer, or iron pot. But instead of firing a cannonball, it's firing a giant arrow. Now this might seem strange to us today, but it really makes a lot of sense as a logical extension of existing technology, basically a gunpowder age adaptation of a giant crossbow or ballista. Now early firearms makers quickly realized that solid stone or metal cannonballs made for superior projectiles. Not only were they more destructive, but they were also more durable, meaning you could pick them up off the battlefield and use them over and over again, whereas a gun arrow would be irreparably damaged on the first shot. However, gun arrows did remain in the arsenals of many nations for another 200 years. In fact, the English adventurer and privateer Sir Francis Drake lists gun arrows among the stores of his ship in 1588. However, the story of flechettes proper really begins in the early 20th century, with the modern incarnation of this weapon being developed by the Italians in the 1910s. Now, between 1911 and 1912, Italy fought a war against the Ottoman Empire in the North African territory of Libya. And while this war is not very well remembered today, it's historically significant because it saw the first use of heavier-than-air craft in combat, with Italian pilots not only flying the first aerial reconnaissance mission with aircraft, but also the first aerial bombardment. And while initially they used adapted infantry weapons like grenades for this purpose, they also developed flechettes as one of the first purpose-built weapons for aerial warfare. And these consisted of large steel darts with fins that were meant to be launched from the air onto large concentrations of troops on the ground. And this could either be done singly by just throwing them out the cockpit of the aircraft, but more often they were packaged together in large boxes that were mounted either within the fuselage or underneath it, and the pilot would pull a string to open the box and release a salvo of flechettes onto the target. Now, these weapons would later be adopted by the French, and then the Germans, and the British, and were used extensively in the opening years of the First World War. And during the war, flechettes were typically dropped in groups of between 20 and 250, with one French pilot in March 1915 having been recorded as dropping over 18,000 flechettes in a single day. And the Germans seemed to have not really appreciated having this weapon used against them by the French, because when they finally adopted flechettes for themselves, they made sure to engrave every single one with the words French invention, German manufacture. Quite a nasty piece of pettiness there. Uh, the British also didn't like these weapons, but for completely different reasons, with one Royal Flying Corps officer being quoted in The War Illustrated as saying, Our aviators think arrow dropping dirty work, because the enemy cannot hear the things coming, and because they make such nasty wounds. Also, it was not possible to drop them with sufficient accuracy. In other words, just like submarine warfare, they believed flechettes to be ungentlemanly and damned un-British. However, they did experiment extensively with the use of flechettes not against personnel, but rather against German zeppelins. And the idea here was that an airman would climb up above the zeppelin and drop these flechettes down on top of it, and they would pierce through the envelope and the gas bags. Unfortunately, this proved as ineffective as just firing regular ammunition at the zeppelins. All it did was punch some relatively small holes in the envelope, which would leak so slowly that it really wouldn't make a difference to the zeppelin's mission. Later, the British would invent incendiary bullets to increase their chances of actually setting the Zeppelin ablaze and taking it down. And in the same vein, a Royal Navy commander named Francis Rankin came up with the Rankin anti-Zeppelin dart. And just like previous versions, this was meant to be dropped on the Zeppelin from above, but it had a set of folding fins attached to the detonator of an incendiary charge. So when it actually punched through the envelope of the Zeppelin, the fins would get left behind and they would pull the detonator and activate the charge. 
But while this worked in principle, in practice, it proved a lot harder to set a Zeppelin alight than it would seem. This is because of one crucial missing ingredient, oxygen. If you set off an incendiary in the middle of a space full of pure hydrogen, like the gas bag of a Zeppelin, nothing is going to happen because there is no oxygen for that hydrogen to react with. And so the tactic that the British eventually came up with that really worked well was to arm their aircraft with an alternating belt of explosive and incendiary ammunition. The explosive ammunition would blow big holes in the envelope of the Zeppelin, allowing oxygen to enter and mix with the hydrogen. And then the incendiary ammunition would set off that mixture. And this worked really quite well. Now, in the anti-personnel role, flechettes were gruesomely effective, but the problem was they had to score a direct hit in order to cause any damage. And by 1917, they were almost completely phased out in favor of far more effective weapons, basically high explosive bombs, which could affect the area immediately around them and required less precise aim. So the development of flechettes more or less went dormant for the next 40 years, only being resurrected shortly after the Second World War. And one of the first such developments was called Project Lazy Dog, and this was a U.S. Navy effort to develop an airdropped anti-personnel weapon that could make use of their vast stocks of surplus 50 BMG machine gun ammunition. And the development process was quite interesting. They would empty the propellant powder out of the casings of the 50 BMG rounds, and then cut and shape the casing into various configurations of stabilizing fins. And then they would test the aerodynamic performance of all of these different configurations. And tests were conducted both in wind tunnels and also in live drop tests at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. What they found was that the ideal aerodynamic configuration used not the full bullet with its lead and copper jacket components, but rather the steel core of the bullet fitted with a small set of folded metal fins. And this was adopted as the yellow dog or lazy dog bomb. And I have an example of one right here. So initially they used the cores of surplus 50 BMG ammunition, but eventually as these weapons were adopted on a much larger scale, they started manufacturing them from scratch. Uh, this is an earlier version that has a forged steel body. Later versions were actually machined on a lathe, but both had the same type of folded sheet metal tail fins. So Lazy Dog bombs were used during both the Korean and Vietnam Wars and were deployed in a number of different ways. Some as simple as just chucking buckets of them from a helicopter as you flew over the jungle. But more typically, they were deployed from cluster munition adapters such as the Mark 44 or the Mark IV Mod Zero Glad Eye. And so up to 2,000 of these projectiles would be packed into these adapters, and these would be suspended from the hard points of an aircraft and released over the target. And after a certain distance, a fuse in the nose of the canister would cause it to split open and release the projectiles. And these were found to be incredibly effective at penetrating thick jungle canopy and simple wooden shelters. And they were absolutely devastating when used against large concentrations of enemy troops out in the open. Indeed, when dropped from a high-speed ground attack aircraft, these could develop the terminal energy equivalent to a 50 BMG round. In testing, they were able to penetrate two feet of packed sand. And when dropped from something like a Sky Raider or a helicopter, they could still develop quite a bit of terminal energy, somewhere between a 45 ACP and a 30 carbine bullet. So really not something that you want to be at the receiving end of. So around the same period, the U.S. Army was doing a lot of research on the application of flechettes to individual infantry weapons. And the reason for this has to do with some reports that came out of the Second World War that showed that most infantry engagements took place at ranges less than 300 yards, and that the average infantryman, who is tired and hungry and under a lot of stress, takes about 10,000 shots in order to score one hit on the enemy. This sort of flew in the face of conventional U.S. Army doctrine, which focused a lot on individual marksmanship, on single, carefully aimed shots made at long ranges. It became apparent that soldiers needed a lot more firepower in order to make them more effective. And this, of course, led to the development of the assault rifle concept, of having an intermediate cartridge halfway between a full-powered rifle cartridge and a pistol cartridge, which allowed you to achieve a balance between controllable automatic fire and sufficient accuracy at the shorter ranges over which infantry engagements typically took place. 
But the US Army wanted to go one step further and develop a weapon that was capable of even greater firepower so that, say, if you're on patrol in the jungle and you only see the enemy for a brief moment, you are able to send a lot of projectiles down range in a very short amount of time, greatly increasing your chances of making a hit. And so in 1951, the US Army started something called Project Salvo to investigate methods of achieving this type of firepower. And there were a number of different methods that were proposed, including the use of duplex or triplex bullets, basically one bullet stacked on top of another within the same cartridge. And this meant that for a single recoil impulse, you could send multiple projectiles down range, increasing your hit probability. But while Project Salvo didn't lead to the adoption of any new weapons, it did eventually evolve into the Special Purpose Infantry Weapon Project, or Project SPEW, which began in 1962 and involved a number of different firearms manufacturers, including H&R, Winchester, Springfield, and Advanced Armaments Incorporated, or AAI. And by this time, the methodology had shifted from duplex or triplex bullets to the use of flechettes. And the logic here is that flechettes can be made significantly lighter than regular bullets, meaning that they will impart a softer recoil impulse when they're fired. And so you can have a weapon with a three round burst capability where by the time you actually start feeling the recoil impulse and the firearm starts to rise and go off aim, the three flechettes have already left the barrel and are on their way to the target. So you get the advantage of having a shotgun with multiple projectiles going towards the target, along with the long range accuracy of a rifle. However, since flechettes are significantly lighter than regular bullets, in order to give them the same terminal energy and thus the same terminal effect as regular bullets, they need to be fired at a much higher velocity. But thankfully, here the physics actually works in your favor, since kinetic energy is given by one half mv squared, whereas momentum, which was responsible for the recoil force, is given by mv. This means that if you have a projectile that is a quarter of the weight of a regular bullet, but is traveling twice as fast, you will get the same terminal energy, but only half the recoil impulse. So velocity is also key when it comes to the stability of a flechette. So the stability of a fin stabilized projectile is dependent on the aerodynamic forces imparted on its tail fins, which serve to correct any deviation from its flight path. And those aerodynamic forces are dependent on two main factors, the size, the surface area of the fins, and the velocity of the projectile. But if you want your flechette to fit inside the barrel of a regular firearm, those fins can't be too big. And so to achieve sufficient stability, the flechette needs to travel at a much higher velocity. And this has important implications in certain applications of flechettes, but we'll get there in a moment. Now, while all of this is fairly straightforward in principle, in practice, companies like AAI had significant difficulties in getting flechette firing rifles to work. And one of the main problems had to do with the fact that the flechette, or at least the front half of the flechette, is of a different diameter than the gun barrel. And so you need some way of supporting the flechette as it's traveling down the barrel. And the most obvious way of doing this is with a sabot, a sort of plastic shoe that fits over the front and the back of the flechette, fills out the space between it and the barrel and supports it all the way out of the firearm. And then when it clears the barrel, the sabot falls away and the flechette continues on its merry way. Now in normal sabot ammunition, like say the armor piercing rounds used by certain tanks, the sabot wraps around the rear of the projectile. However, since flechettes are so long, this would create an unacceptably long cartridge. And so instead you have to put the sabot at the front of the flechette and have the rest of it inside the cartridge casing. This is where you really start running into difficulties because you have to get the material and the design and the tension of that polar sabot just right. If it's too loose, it'll fly off the end of the flechette, leaving it behind in the barrel, or the flechette will just come out of the barrel at a very low velocity. If it's too tight and it doesn't release early enough, it's going to stay with the flechette and it's going to affect its aerodynamics and its accuracy. Or at worst, and this actually happened in testing, it will basically snap the flechette in half and leave the rear back in the barrel. And indeed, because of such difficulties, AAI found that the accuracy of its SPEW rifles was absolutely atrocious, and neither SPEW nor the follow-on Advanced Combat Rifle, or ACR program, succeeded in producing an adequate flechette firing replacement 
for the M16. And if you want to learn more about those, go over to Forgotten Weapons. Ian has a couple of videos on developmental rifles from Project Salvo, Project Spew, and ACR. Now, one type of flechette firing personal infantry weapon that did see service during the Vietnam War was the combat shotgun. And two companies, the Western Cartridge Company and the Federal Cartridge Company, produced shot shells containing 18mm long flechettes. The Western shot shells containing 20 flechettes and the Federal shot shells 25 flechettes. But these were found to be quite ineffective. And if you go over to the channel Tau Fleeta Mouse, he tests out one of these shot shells and finds that the flechettes don't fire straight at all. They actually tend to tumble and keyhole quite badly. And the reason for this has to do with the stability problem that we discussed before. If you want a fin-stabilized projectile to fly straight, you either need to make the fins large enough or you need to fire the projectile fast enough. But if you want to pack as many flechettes into a shot shell as possible, in fact, that's the reason for having this weapon system in the first place, you can't make the fins too big. The problem with the shotgun is that it can only handle up to a certain amount of pressure and muzzle velocity. And in this case, that muzzle velocity turned out to be not fast enough to get sufficient aerodynamic effect out of those tiny fins. And so the darts aren't stable at all. And as soon as they start to veer off course, they will start to tumble. So another type of flechette firing munition that was widely used during the Vietnam War was the so-called beehive round. And this was intended for use by artillery such as the 106 millimeter recoilless rifle or 105 millimeter howitzers to allow artillery batteries to defend themselves at close range against enemy attacks, basically taking the same role as canister shot or grape shot in earlier eras. And there are two differing explanations as to how these came to be known as beehive rounds. One is that the sound of hundreds of flechettes flying through the air sounded like a swarm of angry bees, whereas the other more plausible explanation is that the round with all of its flechettes stacked inside of chambers inside looked like an old-fashioned beehive. However, these rounds were eventually replaced in service with a set of tactics known as Killer Senior or Killer Junior, depending on what caliber of artillery was being used, and this involved short-fusing regular high-explosive shells that they detonated very close to the battery and showered the attacking enemy with fragments. And flechette-firing shells are still used to this day, typically fired by tanks, again, for anti-personnel use. For example, the United States has the M546 APERS, or anti-personnel shell, for 105mm weapons, which contains some 8,000 flechettes. While the Russians have the 122mm SH-1 flechette shell, which they've recently used in certain parts of Ukraine. Israel also uses flechette shells, and in one infamous incident in April 2008, an IDF tank fired a flechette round at Reuters cameraman Fidel Shana because they thought that his camera was a weapon. And this ended up killing Shana as well as eight civilians in the surrounding area. Now, something worth noting here is one application in which the use of flechettes is absolutely essential, and that is in underwater firearms. So, ordinary bullets designed for use in air don't perform very well underwater. They lose energy very quickly, and they're not stable. So if you want to have a firearm that works effectively underwater, you need to fire not a regular bullet, but rather a long dart-shaped projectile that is drag-stabilized and not gyroscopically stabilized. And this has been successfully implemented in a number of firearms, including the Soviet APS and ASMDT rifles and SPP-1 pistol, and the Heckler & Koch P-11 pistol. If you want to learn more about underwater firearms, I wrote an entire video on the subject over on Today I Found Out. And finally, we get to our last example of a flechette. These are out of a CRV-7. This is a 2.75-inch unguided rocket weapon widely used by multiple NATO nations. And the CRV-7 was developed in the early 1970s by Bristol Aerospace, today Magellan, of Winnipeg, Manitoba, my hometown. And this is an offshoot of the development of the Black Brant sounding rocket, which used a new type of high-energy rocket propellant. And what Bristol did was to apply this propellant to a new 2.75-inch rocket weapon along the same lines as the American Hydra 70. And the resulting weapon, the CRV-7, turned out to be significantly more powerful than the Hydra 70. It had a flatter trajectory, it had 1,000 meters more standoff distance, and three times the terminal energy. 
And this led to a rather funny incident at a NATO weapons demonstration in France. Now, the competitors were supposed to fire inert rockets, that is, with no warhead, at a target tower. But the Canadian pilot, being used to firing the less powerful Hydra 70, fired his rocket from too close a range, so that when it actually struck the target, there was still burning propellant in the motor. And so the casing shattered, exposed the propellant to the air, and this caused a rapid deflagration that completely destroyed the tower. And Canada was temporarily disqualified from the competition because the judges couldn't believe that the rocket was unarmed. It just had that much kinetic energy. And indeed, during firing trials in Canada, it was found that even the practice warheads, which is simply a mild steel rod with a nylon casing, could still penetrate the top armor of the Centurion tanks they were using as targets. And this led to the development of the Flechette Anti-Tank, or FAT warhead, which contains five large tungsten darts capable of penetrating the top and side armor of a T-72 tank at a range of 3,000 meters as well as the GPF, or General Purpose Flechette Warhead, and that contains 80 of these little flechettes. And how this works is that the CRV-7 is spin-stabilized. It has spiral veins in its motor nozzle that cause it to start spinning even before it leaves its launcher. And once it has left the launcher, a set of spring-loaded fins deploy and cause the rocket to start spinning faster. Now the motor burns for about two seconds, and once it's burnt out, it activates a small gunpowder charge in the warhead that shoots the canister containing these flechettes out the front. And then the centrifugal force causes all of the flechettes to be thrown out sideways, creating a large spread of flechettes to rain down on the target. And I actually once worked a summer at Magellan Aerospace at the facility where they make the CRV-7, and I got to see one of these warheads being fired. And what they did was they put it in a lathe and spun it up to its working RPM and then fired off the warhead at a high-speed camera. And I can tell you the footage of those darts coming out into this big spiral of death is absolutely terrifying. And just as terrifying is the fact that that tiny gunpowder charge managed to propel the nose cone of the warhead through one of the two layers of bulletproof glass that was protecting the high-speed camera. And despite their small size, these flechettes are actually capable of penetrating up to 1.5 inches of roll-hardened armor, making them useful against lighter armored vehicles, soft-skinned vehicles, buildings, and other relatively soft targets. And GPF-equipped CRV-7s are mainly designed to be used from helicopters, and they're used by a variety of NATO nations, including the UK, who really liked using these things in Afghanistan against large concentrations of enemy fighters. So once again, something you really don't want to be on the receiving end of. And so there you have a brief history of the flechette, one of the more fascinating, if under-discussed, weapons to have come out in the last hundred years. Now, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time on another episode where we'll have a look at yet more fascinating military and civilian hardware. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.